heard me. Good morning, Carmel Press. It is good to be in worship together. Um, I always think it's funny how we've lived a week of life, and so much can happen. So for me this week, I went rock climbing. I figured out what canyoneering was. I went whitewater rafting for the first time with 33 of our uh, students, high school students, and leaders. So thank you for praying by name. It really means a lot to these kids to know that there are people that don't know them that are praying for them by name. And so if you are praying for a specific name this week, feel free to ask me or one of our leaders what God did in the lives of those kids. Because I can tell you that the family of God has two new believers and many, many rededications, many kids who our theme this week was identity, many kids who, who reaffirmed their decision to follow Jesus, reaffirmed that, that God is their number one and that they want to follow him. And Ben and I were just reflecting on, we went into this trip not knowing what this camp was going to be about. We had never been up there. And so there was a lot of of trust and faith put into us um, that we were putting into the Lord. And so this camp um, was up in in Coloma, California, Northern California. And every day we went on these epic adventures with kids. But every night we got to gather around the campfire and tell stories and talk about the faithfulness of Jesus, what he did on the cross. Um, and just marvel, really, at who he is. So we are amazed at what God did in a week, and we are excited then in another week to, to head out for our middle school camp to Hume Lake. So next Sunday, would you be praying for us in that trip as well? There's a couple of really fun things happening in the life of our church over the next several weeks. So this Friday is the Jazz and Desserts event. Please come. It's at 6.30. Yes, give a little clap for the Jazz and Desserts. It's going to be really fun. <laughs> Uh, 6.30, the doors open, and 7 o'clock, the concert starts. This is a perfect event to invite a friend to, someone maybe who would, you would think wouldn't come to a church building, would never want to be in your Bible study, but they love music or they love sweets, and we're going to have both of those things on Friday night. So please come, please show up, please invite someone, and also know that the donations that are being, it's a free concert, but there'll be an opportunity to give a donation, and it goes to the, to the jazz festival, specifically to the, the local education programs of the Monterey Jazz Festival. Another fun event we have this month is on next Sunday, the 24th, at 1215, the Friendship Circle is going to have a movie matinee. And so right after the the last service, they'll be watching the movie Reluctant Convert, and it's the untold story of C.S. Lewis. It's $10 to attend, and that includes some food, hot dogs, and popcorn, and candy, the best of going to the movie theater. Um, But you have a bathroom, really easily accessible. You don't have to, like, miss the whole movie. So show up. You can sign up on the patio in between the services or feel free to email Susan Coleman. Her email is on the screen uh, to sign up and then you can pay at the door. So that's for those of you at home that want to attend, email Susan. Otherwise, sign up on the patio between services. And lastly, to finish off this month, we have our Great Commission Sunday, which will be July 31st. And on that Sunday after the services, we will have a lunch with our missionaries down in Friendship Hall. It's at 1215. It is free to attend. We would just love to know you're coming so we can plan for food. So there's also another table on the patio. You can write down your name, your email, and then how many people you're going to be bringing so we can plan for different kinds of food. I think we're going to have more of an international uh, food festival. um, And then we'll be hearing from many of our missionaries that will be here in person about the power of prayer in mission. So we'd love for you to join us for all the things we have going on this month. And now if you're able, we're going to continue in worship through song. So would you stand?
Please pray with me. Good morning, Lord. We praise you today for sending your son to assume the burden of our sin, which we, in our brokenness, are not able to bear. We praise you for who you are, ever holy, infinite, incomprehensible, omnipotent, sovereign, and loving. We thank you, Lord, for protection over the high school ministry trip last week and prayers for the seeds of faith planted and faith deepened in the students' lives. As we make our prayer request to you this morning, let your words from Philippians 4 be our guide. Rejoice in the Lord always. I will say it again. Rejoice. Let your gentleness be evident to all. The Lord is near. Do not be anxious about anything, but in every situation by prayer and petition with thanksgiving. Present your request to God, and the peace of God which transcends all understanding will guard your hearts and minds in Christ Jesus. Lord, we pray for the safety of our president, our elected officials, and judiciary. Protect them from all forces of evil. We pray they will exercise spiritual wisdom as they lead our country. Lord, for our governor and all California elected officials, we pray they will govern our state with compassion, mercy, and grace. Lord, for our local leadership here in the Monterey Peninsula, we pray they will hear the cries of the homeless, the lonely, and oppressed, and govern over them with love and mercy. Father, we ask you to watch over Pastor Tim, Katie, and the girls as they enjoy their opportunity for refreshment and reflection during their break from ministering to us. We pray they return with renewed spirit and enthusiasm. Lord, please forgive us when we allow ourselves to become caught up in the horrific images of evil occurring across the world. Our hearts are gripped by persecution of our brothers and sisters in places we name in today's prayer. Ukraine, the unrelenting war. Ethiopia, civil war and famine, again. Nigeria, incomprehensible murder of Christians. And Russia, spiritual famine. Yet we know and trust that the evil one is under your authority and the outcome certain for those instigating these acts. Your light will overcome this darkness. We now ask you, O oh God, to put on our hearts what our response to the ever-present evil around us should be. Encourage us to be bold in our witness. Our only hope is in you, Lord. And so with thanksgiving, let us now pray together the prayer you taught us to pray. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day bread and forgive us our debts as we forgive our debtors. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, the power, and the glory forever. Amen. Thank you for your continued generous giving to our church. We have collection boxes here in the sanctuary for your donations, or you can do as many people do these days, practice online giving. Thank you.
Good morning. Um, if you're able, will you please stand out of respect for the reading of the, uh, God's word, please? We have two readings this morning. The first is from Mark, chapter 1. Um, After John was put in prison, Jesus went into Galilee, proclaiming the good news of God. The time has come, he said. The kingdom of God is near. Repent and believe the good news. Our second reading is in Matthew. Um, Matthew 6, verses 9 through 10. This, then, is how you pray. Our Father in heaven, hallowed be your name. Your kingdom come, your will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. This is the word of God. Please be seated. Well, good morning. It's so good to be back with you for a second week. Uh, I got invited back. That's a good sign, I think. Uh, so uh, glad to be here. And for those of you watching online, we're grateful that you're a part of this time, too. Oh, I've got to turn on my microphone. So I need to do this uh, all over. There, there, how about that? Yes? Okay. Good morning. <laughs> And I am grateful for those watching online as well. Uh, hey, it's so good to be with you. And um, as you know, I'm here at Carmel. I'm a, a long-term pastor working with Eco Blue Water Presbytery and uh, really have two assignments here at Carmel right now. The one that's most important for us today is the fact that as Pastor Tim is on vacation, I'm here to kind of be available for any kind of pastoral care needs to uh, work with any kind of ministry issues and to be with the staff during this time while he's away. And so up on the screen, you'll see my phone number an email address if there's any way that I can serve you during this time while Pastor Tim is on vacation. I want to encourage you to just shoot me a note and uh, let me know what I can do to pray for you, to encourage you. Uh, a couple people wrote after last week. They wanted to chat about some things said in the message. You got another prayer request from another individual, and I'm just happy and delighted uh, to serve you in whatever way that you want. Uh, now, the second uh, part of my work here at Carmel is I've been working with your elders and Pastor Tim and the staff, and we continue that work in really looking at vision and mission and forward movement to help Carmel do what ECO, the movement of churches that we're all a part of, uh, says is its top priority, and that is to make flourishing churches who in turn make flourishing disciples. And so the call of God for our eco-movement is that every church would flourish in the grandest, best, uh, most life-giving way possible. And it's a privilege to work with your elders and leadership uh, in that role here. And so I, I'm thankful for both parts of that, and I'm thankful today to be able to share God's word with you. It's in this message series that we're doing that I really want to kick into that idea of being a flourishing church, and these two messages are really intended uh, to go hand in glove with the work that I'm doing. Uh, now, before uh, diving into the messages, uh, for those of you that uh, were here last week, you heard that it was 113 when I came last week. It stayed 113 the whole darn week. We had one day of monsoon rain. That just increased the humidity, uh, which was not grand. I was outside continuing my work on digging new irrigation lines, so not a whole lot of fun. But I want you to know, Phoenix is not just a hot place. And up on the screen is a picture of where we went uh, last winter, uh, only an hour and a half from Phoenix. We go play in the snow. So there is opportunities to be in the snow, even uh, outside the Valley of the Sun. That's my wife, Deborah, and our Shetland sheepdog, Ellie, who goes everywhere with us. She's a blast. And uh, she was grabbing onto me when I was leaving because it was like a sheep leaving the pen. And she, wouldn't, she didn't want me to go out the door uh, before I left come up here. But we're grateful to do that. And the other thing that we're excited about that I shared is we are now uh, grandparents for the first time. And in two weeks, we get to go visit our grandson for only the second time. Ethan uh, is with his parents down in Garden Grove, and we will be visiting them uh, at the end of this month. So we're excited about that. It's a new season of life. We're uh, grateful to um, do that. And I'm grateful to be with all of you. So I want to dive into our message today. Let me pray, and then we'll get right into it. So Heavenly Father, I stand before you and your word, and we together believe your word is living and active, and that the Holy Spirit, your Holy Spirit, works in every believing heart 
to lead us into all truth. So I ask that you would open our hearts and illuminate our minds and transform our wills, that your word will make an enduring impact in our lives. And so today, may the gospel of the kingdom be proclaimed, and may you be honored and glorified, not only through your word today, but in our response to it in the days ahead. I pray this in your most holy name. Amen. So we've been... uh, Last week and in this week, I'm doing kind of a thematic study. You probably noticed last week, and you'll see it again. We're not taking a single text of Scripture and diving deep into it. I'm wanting to paint a picture at kind of like 50,000 feet of elevation for you all in terms of understanding for you all as members of the kingdom of God and the family of faith and members of this particular church what it means to live in this day. And so we uh, are in this theme of uh, what I call being covered in his dust, the dust of Rabbi Jesus. And we're looking at, last week, we looked at what it meant to be a disciple, to be that person who follows after Jesus in a profound and deep way. And what I shared with you, and I'm going to summarize just a little bit of that message again because it ties to today's message so well. What I summarize for you is that there was a sense of what it meant to be a disciple that had evolved even before Jesus' day that was so profound and um, anchored into the spirit of learning that in Jesus' day, when he uses this word disciple, it's packed with meaning. Um, Some couple hundred years before Jesus' time, uh, there was a gentleman, Jose Ben Yoetzer, who is recorded in the Mishnah as saying this, Let thy house be a meeting place for the wise, and powder thyself in the dust of their feet, and drink their words with thirstiness. Now what I want you to do is understand that this was a saying that was intended to encourage people to make their homes places of Bible study, to welcome itinerant teachers, the sages, the wise into their homes, to eagerly learn from them. And what you see in the middle of this sentence is, powder thyself in the dust of their feet. It's a very unique phrase. And what has come to be understood by that phrase was uh, the idea, one of two ways. Either one, it was the idea that as you sat at the teacher's feet, normally on the ground with a teacher on a stool above, you would be at the feet of that individual and there's dust and dirt and all that right there. And so the idea of sitting at the feet of someone to learn from them was true. But there was also a second idea. When you were a disciple, you followed that wise teacher. You followed that sage literally in life. And the teaching occurred in the context of everyday living and, and life. And so you would walk with that person as they went through life. And so this idea of following in the dust also had this idea of following the master right in their footsteps. Here he goes, and I'm right behind him, and I'm watching, and I'm learning, and I'm listening, and I'm interacting with his thinking, and I'm trying to discern what I can learn. And the idea was be so close that you get covered in his dust. That was this whole uh, encouragement. And so when we look at that, in Jesus' day then, a disciple was someone who made an all-in commitment to follow in the ways of this wise teacher, and the goal was simply this, if they encounter me, they will see my master. The goal was not that they'll see me and all my goodness, But rather, I am learning, I'm following in the dust so that when people see me, who would they really see is a reflection of the master that I am following. So last week we learned that Jesus, when he extends his invitation with three words, come, follow me, he is inviting his disciples to follow so close after him that they become like him. The words are powerful and strong. He's saying, be covered in my dust, become to the fullest extent possible like me. And for you and for me as disciples in our age and stage of life, that means that if they see you, someone sees you, if they relate to you, if they hear from you, they ought to encounter him. In your life as a disciple, people ought to encounter Jesus 
And so this is an ongoing work that we do. Nobody becomes a disciple overnight. And if you uh, uh, have any kind of sense of, you know, telling it like it is, I'll just tell it like it is. I sometimes follow him well and sometimes I mess up, right? That's true for all of us. We're constantly in process of growing and developing, of being sanctified. And so this is an ongoing work. And the key then is to be a disciple of Jesus means you need to stay in relationship with Jesus through the power of the Spirit working in you, through the power of prayer, through the power of the living word that you're encountering and studying and reading all about. And so we don't just say, I arrived, I'm now a disciple. We understand that it's an ongoing journey with Rabbi Jesus. And therefore, Dallas Willard puts it so, so well. He says this, someone, a, a disciple is someone who is learning from Jesus how to lead their life as he would lead their life if he were in their place. Notice that this is a present tense experience, learning from Jesus in your prayer life, in your reading of scripture, in your devotion, in uh, the work of the Holy Spirit in you. Are you learning from Jesus day by day what it means to live your life the way he would love to have you live your life? And this is so, so important as we now move to the second part of my message. And, and it's simply this. Disciples in Jesus' day, what he was clear about was these disciples had a desire and a submission. And as one commentator put it, uh, there was this desire, submission, and assumed that emulation, biblical literacy, community, transparency, and a willingness to wrestle with God's word were a given. That was all understood. But it also included, and this is the important point, it also included a passion together with zeal to give up any and all of their preconceived notions of how to live one's life and then to embrace the behavior that their rabbi deemed best to honor God. It was in effect a radical, willing, and totally conforming submission to the interpretive authority of the rabbi. It was all in. When Jesus says, come follow me, he's inviting you to go all in. It's not just one day. It's not just making assent to what he's done for you. It's to live life with him in a special way. And Jesus says in Luke 4, uh, 640, the student is not above the teacher, but everyone who is fully trained will be like what? Like the teacher. That's what Jesus wants you to do and be. Now, what we learn and know, you and I, is that disciples don't do this living with Jesus alone or in a vacuum. We are called uh, into, from an internal perspective, we are adopted into God's forever family. We become sons and daughters of the King by adoption through faith in Jesus Christ. And we are, Jesus says, born into, by faith in him, we are born into the kingdom of God. See, we don't operate alone. We actually have now, uh, we're part of a movement of God on earth. So Jesus just didn't teach uh, good ways to live or how to be ethical. He proclaimed that something new, something astonishing was present. And he taught that it was in his life and ministry. In fact, here's my first point. Jesus declared that in himself, the kingdom had come. Jesus is making this radical statement that's actually a fulfillment of the biblical storyline. So we see it in Mark 1.14, it was read for you. After John was put in prison, Jesus went into Galilee proclaiming the good news of God. He's, he's preaching and teaching the good news of God, and here's what he says, the time has come. He's saying, it is now. The kingdom of God has come near. He's proclaiming the kingdom, and then he calls people into that through repentance and belief in the good news of the gospel. 
Jesus' ministry was focused this way. And so this idea of the time being now, this is it. This is when the fulfillment takes place. This is when the hopes and expectations of Israel, all of the teaching and the forward looking of the prophets, all of what happened in what we know as the Old Testament, that whole storyline comes to its grand uh, conclusion in Jesus Christ. So he says, repent. He's calling people to change their way of life. It's a complete change of thought, of attitude with regard to sin and with regard to righteousness. It's a turning around, and it's also uh, this idea of believing to put one's faith in. But more than that, it has an implication of trusting and basing your actions on that faith. It's how you're going to live once you say, I believe. So Jesus goes out, and we don't have time today. I could do literally a, ser a sermon series on the kingdom of God, and we could get into all kinds of depth over his teaching, and I don't have time for that today. Again, it's kind of a thematic day, but uh, what Jesus does in his preaching and in his healing and in his ministry is he points over and over again to this brand new radical pronouncement that the kingdom of God has come to earth. Luke 4.43, I must proclaim the good news of the kingdom of God to other towns also because that is why I was sent. Uh, Luke 9.11, the crowds learned it, followed him. He welcomed them and spoke to them about the kingdom of God and healed those who needed healing. Luke 11.20, but if I drive out demons by the finger of God, then the kingdom has, of God has come upon you, he preached. John 3.3, 3, uh, Jesus replied, very truly, I tell you, no one can see the kingdom of God unless they are born again. Mark 4.30, he begins to teach in parables, and we all know the kingdom parables, right? What shall we say the kingdom of God is like, or what parable shall we use to describe it? It's like a mustard seed, and he goes on to teach about the mustard seed. And there are many kingdom par parables that he uses. Jesus, when he does his healing ministry, says the healing ministry is not meant to just be something where people get healed. It's a pointer to the reality that God's power and God's healing love and, and God's forgiveness are now evident and resident on earth. And so the miracles point to the reality of the kingdom of God. And when Jesus was confronting Pontius Pilate, Jesus declared, my kingdom is not of this world. If it were, my servants would fight to prevent my arrest by the Jewish leaders. But now my kingdom is from a different place. He declares it's not God's kingdom, it's his kingdom because this is God the Son, Jesus Christ. So the kingdom of God comes in and through Jesus, his life, death, and resurrection, he has now ascended into heaven. And we've just sung some beautiful hymns about this Lord who's reigning and should be crowned with many crowns. Uh, we, we declare that. We're going to sing some other uh, songs as well that will remind us of what he's done. And what Jesus is teaching on the kingdom of God is that heaven has come to earth. It, is, it follows the biblical storyline where there's been a deep desire for God to be present to his people. And as you know, God uh, from Genesis 3 is working to redeem sinful humanity from the depth of uh, the death that they have encountered because of their sinfulness. Uh, God is working and uh, calls out uh, Abram and Sarai, who become Abraham and Sarah, and he says, all the nations on the earth are going to be blessed through you. God uh, calls his people out of Egypt and out of um, the, the bondage that they are in to slavery as an act that precedes what Jesus is going to do on the cross for you and for me. There's a sense of God being present in the tabernacle, in the wilderness, and then later in the temple. But now God is present by his spirit. And for you and for me, it's not in my notes, but do you know that the scriptures declare that now God's temple is us, living stones, built together into a holy temple in which the Lord is present by his spirit. This new thing that's happening is God's kingdom is coming on earth and acting, and this is what Jesus taught, and what we need to understand is he was not teaching about a kingdom up there. Uh, N.T. Wright says it this way, we should not doubt that God's kingdom denoted the long-awaited rule of Israel's God on earth 
as in heaven. The widespread assumption today that the kingdom of God denotes another realm altogether, for instance, that of heaven to which God's people might hope to go after their death, that was not N.T. Wright writes, that was not a first century agenda. When Jesus spoke about God's kingdom and taught his followers to pray that it would arrive on earth as in heaven, he was right in the middle of first century Jewish aspirations. God, you come to be with us. You be present to us. And so Jesus, number one, declares that in himself the kingdom of God has come. Number two, Jesus gives his disciples, and by extension you and me, he gives us a kingdom prayer to pray. And we have prayed that prayer, you and I, over our, the course of our lifetimes. We did it again today. And it is a powerful prayer, and we can sometimes miss the beauty of it for the familiarity with it. Jesus' kingdom prayer for his disciples to pray is a kingdom to come down kind of prayer. It's God's kingdom unfolding here on earth and God moving in, a sovereign, in his sovereign grace and mercy and healing power and filling people with hope and life, life abundant and free. So Jesus' ministry and teaching is way more about heaven coming to earth through you I'll get to that in a moment, than it is about you and me going from earth up to heaven. If you really look at the balance of his teaching, far more of it is about heaven coming to earth. So the disciples ask about a prayer to pray, and Jesus gives them the prayer. We've, we've said it as a prayer. You've heard it read. I'm going to put it up on the screen one more time to just uh, have you uh, think about it again. This then is how you should pray, Jesus teaches. Our Father in heaven. There's a relationship there. Hallowed be your name. There's honor and glory that needs to be given. Then your, this is Jesus teaching the prayer that people ought to pray. Your kingdom come. Where? Your kingdom come and your will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Our prayer is not, Lord, hallowed be your name. Get me up to heaven as soon as you can. It's no, while I'm living here as a follower of yours, while I'm uh, doing this work, would your kingdom come in such a way that it comes to earth and things happen like they do in the heavenly realms? So when you are praying for to your Father in heaven who knows you and loves you with an everlasting love, when the prayer Jesus taught is spoken from your heart, when you say, hallowed be your name, your kingdom come, your will be done on earth as in heaven, when you do that, you are asking God, you and I are together saying to God, please enter our lives so that your will be done in my life and then all around me because of the way I live. You're saying, Father, may supernatural life that you alone bestow, may it flow into my earthly life so that my life becomes an expression of your goodness and your love and your grace and your mercy and kindness and your kingdom power. So when we think about the kingdom of God, what we're really saying is, and Dallas Willard puts it this way, he says, when you look at the Bible, you see the kingdom of God is God's acting. The kingdom of God is the range, Dallas Willard says, of God's effective will. It's all the things God's up to, whether we can see them or not. I was on a plane yesterday uh, flying for Phoenix here, and I ran into two different groups of people. It's kind of interesting. The first group was I, I've served an eco church in our presbytery uh, uh, in Milpitas. And it turned out there was a, a missions group on the plane coming back from a place called Rainbow Acres in Arizona, uh, which is this beautiful, lovely community for adults with developmental uh, challenges. And you go and minister there. The church that I served uh, in Pleasanton has actually been there as well. And it's just an amazing experience. And so I was talking to folks. And it's like most people on this plane don't know it. But there were disciples of Jesus loving people, caring for people, encouraging people, uh, sharing the good news of the gospel with people. That was all going on this past week in 112 degree heat in the middle of Arizona, right? I met, uh, I sat down next to a couple of people and 
they ask me what I do, and that's always a scary thing. As a pastor, when I get asked what do I do on an airplane, the reactions can go in two extremes. One is they might be a Christian and they're like, oh, this is great, we have lots to talk about. The other one is you see this look come over their face like, oh my gosh, did I cuss before I knew this? You know, did I say something terrible? And they kind of move away from you and the, and the conversation goes way, way down. So this person was asking what I do and I'm like, okay, don't know which way this is going. But they kept probing and what it turned out was these are two uh, uh, Christian women who were coming back from a vacation and we began to talk about ministry and they were talking about their ministry and one feels called into ministry and we have this wonderful conversation. God's kingdom is moving in all kinds of ways whether we can see it or not. And things are happening in both the eternal realm, the spiritual realm, but also in the physical realm of this earth because God's kingdom is advancing through God's people. And so Dallas Willard says, if, if, the, if the kingdom is God's range of effective will, then when I pray, thy kingdom come, thy will be done, I am praying first that God's will may be done in my own life and then around me, and that this is an open door for the Jesus teachings, that his effective will will come into my life. And so he uses the example, that he wills that I will bless and not curse, that my yes will be yes and my no will be no, that I'll not be motivated by anger and contempt as outlined in the Sermon on the Mount. So as someone who is living in the kingdom, Dallas Willard writes, I am praying that this may become a true expression of who I am by inner transformation. Discipleship, he says, is learning how to do that. So we pray this prayer that Jesus taught us and we recognize that that prayer is part of the empowerment for the perspective that we have on life. But it leads to a third part, and this goes right to the heart of uh, things for you as a congregation. Jesus also gives his church a kingdom assignment. We are not here treading water until we get to heaven. We've got a responsibility to do. And Jesus in his resurrection appearance, Matthew 28, you all know it, he declares that the church is to be his witnesses and to go, move out, act, get into this world to go and make other disciples, other followers. And Luke follows that up in Acts by saying that Jesus declares, be my witnesses, go out and tell this good news. So there is a kingdom assignment that Jesus gives to his church that carries forward from generation to generation, from century to century, and every fellowship, every congregation that is a part of the capital C church has a unique setting and context for carrying out this kingdom assignment. The assignment does not change, but the way it happens how it happens, what you do to proclaim the gospel, uh, the gospel will be dependent upon your setting and your context. Let me give you uh, what I think is a humorous example. It might grab one of you the wrong way. I'm not sure. Uh, in the church that I served, there was a, a dear gentleman who was theologically spot on. He was really strong in his faith, biblically very literate, uh, loved the Lord, was very, very... Um, um, committed to his faith, very reverent in his worship. And because of his reverence, one of the things that was uh, a value for him was that we should only use instruments that are kind of heavenly instruments. And for this individual, now here's where it goes, I might get somebody mad, but he's like, there can't be drums in church. Almost like the drums are of the devil. You just, you can't have drums in church, right? And so for him at least, it was in our context, we should not have drums. Can I tell you, I went to Rwanda some time ago and, and learned about what the kingdom of God is doing in promoting reconciliation following the genocide and the work that's being done in profound ways. And one of the things that happened over and over again is I would go into orphanages where children who had become orphans because of the genocide were in worship and we joined them in worship. Do you know the only instrument they played? Drums, big and loud, and it was powerful, and they danced and they sang. So the context there was different than the context here. And, and you would not have thought in Rwanda to not have drums, right? But here we might debate organ, drums, new music, old music. We have all those. 
So kingdom assignments are grounded in the context of the local body of believers. And every church, every fellowship then needs to understand in light of the kingdom assignment to go out into this world, to make a difference, to uh, love people in the name of Jesus, to serve them, to proclaim the gospel of uh, forgiveness of sins and life everlasting, to see transformation that takes place. Well, we do that with an alertness to how we best do it with the people that we're right around, with our neighbors, uh, with those that are closest to us. And so in terms of the work here, what I want to connect are these two ideas then. Disciples are disciples, but disciples are meant to be kingdom doers. The two go hand in hand. You're born into the kingdom of God. You have a place in it and a role in it. And here's the challenge that the church faces today. And I want you to hear this. I want this to be a challenge to you as this particular congregation. We are in a time, just like down through the centuries, where there has been radical shifts. If you look across history, churches have experienced times where all of who they are and what they do is challenged and put to the test. And we are in a moment, we are in a moment now where such a time is upon us where there is rapid change in the culture and in the society. I don't have to tell you this, you know it. Anybody that looks back three years and goes, where were we three years ago and where are we now? Has a, has a real strong sense of the rapid change that has taken place across culture, across society in all kinds of ways, right? And I believe, and this is, uh, this is my take on what's going on, that we are beginning as followers of Jesus to experience what the first followers of Jesus experienced. We are living our faith and uh, we're moving into a setting that is much more like the first century church as we journey into our future. The first followers of Jesus did not, they didn't get invited onto the public square. You know, they were, they were not uh, a part of the cultural and societal milieu. There was even then lots of opposition and struggle. And we're kind of moving back into a similar kind of experience. And so this is really, really important as we understand that our shifting as Christians, the way we do life and ministry and mission is shifting because of the world around us. We need to understand that the values we live by, the choices we make, the way we use our resources, the core beliefs that we confess look increasingly foreign to the world around us. And that should not stop us. It's never stopped the kingdom of God. But we need to be understanding that we're looking stranger, even to our next door neighbors, right? Maybe you've had that experience. Maybe even to members of your own family. And because of that, this strangeness of who we are as Christ followers will actually enable us to more effectively display the magnificent grace and love of God in Jesus. So we dare not shy away. But if you think, now that COVID's over, that we can just do church like we used to do church, I'm telling you, no, you cannot. There is dramatic shifts going on that the church faces in these days. I'm gonna just give you a couple so that you can be praying about it. Number one, there's a huge shift in attendance. And COVID sped up that shift, but you've probably experienced it here. I talk to churches all over the place. I'm working with Menlo Church. I work with Milpitas. Uh, you see it nationally as well. There are people who were at church in worship before COVID who are now either online or disengaged altogether. It's shifted in just the attendance that we see. So that the, the current thinking is, church, whoever you are now, that's you. Whoever's gathered, that's you. So that's, that's one big one. A second big one, and again, we all know this because we've all learned how to Zoom, we've all learned how to be online, is that the digital uh, world includes the church and people are now uh, having content come their way. They're able to select content that helps them grow as a disciple digitally. And so the church needs to find its place in doing ministry in presence to one another, but also needing to understand that it needs to have a digital presence in the wider world if it's going to reach people right in their own community. 
Uh, number three, there's a cultural shift in terms of uh, what it means to have certain kinds of values, and we see that unfolding right now in terms of the abortion debate, and it'll be a call for the church to be clear in its witness and its conviction about what Scripture teaches, and that will come with additional opposition. So what I'm saying to you is we all need to understand that this dramatic shift is going on within our larger society and in the church culture itself, and that things are not going back to the way they were, but that's okay because you and I are part of a movement. You are not a unique solo Christian. You are part of a movement, and the movement is called the kingdom of God. And Jesus declared it had become present in his ministry. He declares to us and teaches us to invite God's power and presence through the Spirit to have that continue to unfold in our lives. And it is incumbent upon every church then to discern the specific ways God wishes to use it in the advancement of his kingdom. And I'm going to challenge you in the weeks ahead to be really thinking through uh, both that outward focus into the community as well as what it means to be disciple makers and to be discipling one another to grow. So there's much there. I'd love to say a lot more, um, but I want to stop at this point. Here's the deal. And I said this last week. I'm going to say it again this week. What our Lord teaches what he is asking, inviting us into is a discipleship relationship with him that even today, even though he's in heaven, uh, ascended to the throne of God, ruling and reigning in power and glory, we can have a relationship with him through the gift and the presence of the Holy Spirit in order that we would grow as his disciples and be his kingdom advancers individually, by his call upon our life, but also collectively as the capital C church and as a local congregation called Carmel Carmel Presbyterian Church, we can be those kingdom advancers. And what we need to do is say, Jesus, I'm all in. I want to do that. So I told you last week, it's a phrase that I use in my own life, and I still believe it to be true. And I want to encourage you again, because Jesus gave his all for me, I offer it's an act of worship. I, it's thanksgiving. It's praise. I offer all of who I am back to him. And I want to invite you to do the same. And what we will see as we do that is there'll be, there'll be change. Nobody likes it, but there'll be change because the kingdom is on the move. But there'll be power and there'll be blessing and the work of the kingdom of God will advance in and through you and this congregation. And I pray that that will be so. Amen. Let's pray. So Jesus, I uh, thank you for your teaching to us. More than that, I thank you for your invitation. Your invitation of grace. You draw us by your own power into a living relationship with you. You alone forgive our sins. You alone in mercy Uh, redeem us. uh, We are born again by the Spirit into this new life and into uh, kingdom living, and for that we are grateful. Lord, I pray today that you would help each of us consider this week what we might do to be your disciples living and advancing your kingdom in this world till you take us home or you return. I pray blessing over every household represented there, here, those listening online as well. I pray, Lord, that you would cause us to have hearts that say, I am all in, Jesus, for you and for what you are doing in this world. And to do that with the certainty of the hope of the gospel and of how you will one day bring all things to their grand conclusion when we will experience glory like we cannot possibly imagine. So Lord, we open our hearts to you. I pray you would work in each one for your kingdom's sake, for your glory. Amen.
forward to chatting with you outside after this service is concluded. If you need prayer for anything uh, in the front by the prayer wreath, there'll be a prayer team there available to pray for you. Let us pray God's kingdom power into your life for whatever you need. And uh, today as we close, I just want to offer this as a word of blessing. I pray over each of you and ask that the Lord would bless you, uh, covering you in his love, in his grace and forgiveness and mercy. But more than that, uh, continuing his work of pouring his character and life into yours. May you walk the walk of faith as you are here on earth, as people who are constantly seeking to be covered in the dust of Rabbi Jesus. And may people, as they encounter you, see him. God bless you and be with you now and forevermore. Amen.